live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. What is the goal of the NFL Draft? Well, it's quite simple. The goal is to try and improve your team and make them better than they were beforehand. You want to draft the best players that fill needs that will enable you to compete and play at a high level. This seems pretty obvious, right? Every team is looking to get better during the draft and has their own interests in mind. But in 1986, the Dallas Cowboys had other ideas because their goal wasn't necessarily to get better or to improve their squad. In 1986, the Cowboys' main goal during the draft was to screw over their biggest rival. This is Arizona kicker Max Sandejas. I want to make it very clear. In 1986, the Cowboys did not need to draft a kicker. When they drafted Zendejas, and with a fairly high draft pick I might add, even Zendejas was stunned and kinda confused, because he was thinking, just like everyone else, why the heck the Cowboys did this? The drafting of Zendejas by the Cowboys was for one reason, and one reason only, and it was not to improve their team. It was despite Washington. And it backfired in pretty hilarious fashion. Buckle up, because we're about to talk about the pettiest draft pick ever made. This is the story behind the greatest spite pick, of all time. Before I talk about the pick in question, how good he was in college, and why the Cowboys did this in the first place, we need some context to understand how Washington was doing in the NFC East, because it will help us to understand their need at the kicker position. For over a decade at this point, Washington had one of the best kickers in football, as in 1974, they acquired a guy by the name of Mark Mosley. And let's just say that Mosley was nothing short of sensational in his decade-plus tenure in the nation's capital. If you want to learn more about the legendary career of Mosley, and one of the greatest kicks in NFL history that has been somewhat forgotten more than four and a half decades later, click the card in the upper right corner. However, here's a brief rundown of his accolades and all that he accomplished, because I would be here all day if I listed every single thing that he did in Washington. In 1976, he led the NFL with 22 field goals made, then followed that up in 1977 by once again leading the league with 21 field goals made. He became the first player in team history to ever lead the league in this category twice, let alone in back-to-back -back seasons, and became the first player since the legendary Cleveland Browns Hall of Famer Lou Graza to lead the NFL in this category in consecutive seasons, as Graza did this from 1952 to 54. Mosley led the NFL in field goals a third time in 1979, which also netted him Pro Bowl honors for the first time in his career, as well as a second-team All-Pro nomination. And in 1982, he had one of the greatest seasons by any kicker in the history of the NFL, when he led the league in this category for a fourth time, joining Lou Graza, Jack Manders of the Chicago Bears from the 1930s, and Ward Cuff of the New York Giants from the 1940s as the only players in NFL history to be a champion in this category four times. During the 1982 season, he went 20 for 21, hitting on 95.2% of his field goals. At the time, amongst all qualified kickers, he set the NFL record for highest field goal percentage in a single season, and was one of just three kickers to ever finish a season above 89%. For his efforts, Mosley was not only named a Pro Bowler and a first-team All-Pro, but he was also named the MVP of the league, becoming the first and, to date, the only kicker to ever win this award. I'm going to bet a heavy amount of money on the fact that as long as the NFL is a thing, he will be the only kicker to ever receive this honor. And he also helped Washington win the Super Bowl that year, as with their win over Miami at Super Bowl 17, he was a part of the team that won the very first Super Bowl in franchise history. By the end of the 1985 season, Mosley was 7th in NFL history in points scored, and was 4th in NFL history in field goals made, only behind Jan Stenerud, George Blanda, and Jim Turner. Long story short, he was really good. However, unless your name is Tom Brady, father time is undefeated. And after being one of the top kickers in all of football for years, by 1985, just three years after his MVP season where he put up record-breaking numbers and accuracy for a kicker that we had never seen before, Mark Mosley was a shell of his former self. He was going to be 38 years old by the start of the 1986 season. And while it's not impossible for kickers to play in their late 30s, as plenty of guys have done it, and have done it really well, it's a lot harder when you're already on the decline. Because his 37-year-old season in 1985 was arguably the worst of his career. He hit just 64.7% of his field goals, going 15 for 26 from 30-plus yards. That means that if you were kicking from the 13-yard line or beyond, 
you only had about a 57% chance of the kick going in. In Washington's final four games, Mosley missed a field goal in every single one of them, as over the final month of the season, he went 7 for 15, hitting less than 47% of his kicks, including an embarrassing performance against the St. Louis Cardinals in the regular season finale, where he missed three kicks, going 2 for 5. It wasn't just a bad season by his standards, it was a bad season by NFL standards, as he finished 20th out of 29 qualified kickers in field goal percentage, with the second half of the season being significantly worse. The writing was on the wall. Mosley was on the decline due to his old age, and was only going to get worse if they kept him around in 1986. He had no more power in his leg. With that, Washington needed a kicker badly. If they were going to compete in the NFC East, where the New York Giants were looking great and where the Dallas Cowboys were always a formidable opponent, then they would need to upgrade a kicker, because they couldn't afford to have Mosley's now weak and erratic leg cost them a shot at the postseason. And entering the 1986 NFL Draft, they had just the target in mind. From 1982 to 1985, Arizona had a pretty good football team. Under head coach Larry Smith, they had a winning record every single season, and finished in the top half of the Pac-10 all four years, even making it to the Sun Bowl in 1985, which was not only their first bowl appearance since 1979, but the first time ever that the Wildcats did not lose a bowl game. And while there were many reasons for this, and while there were many reasons for this highly successful period of Wildcat football, you can't downplay the importance of great special teams play, because for all four years, their kicker was one of the best in college football, as Max and Dejas, much like Ashford and Simpson, was solid as a rock. In his four seasons with the Wildcats, Zendejas hit 74% of his field goals, and scored 360 points. To this day, the 360 points scored is an Arizona record, and no player has even come close to topping it. As outside of Art Lupino, who kicked for the team from 1953 to 56, no one in Arizona history has even scored 300 career points. That record is likely staying for a long time, because Zendejas was that good and was that important to the school's football team all four years. Aside from his clutch performance in big games, such as game-winning field goals against Arizona State in 1985 and Notre Dame in 1982, he was near the top of the conference and even the top of the entire NCAA in a ton of major statistical categories. He finished 5th in the entire NCAA in points scored in 1983, when he hit 80% of his field goals and finished inside the top 3 of the Pac-10 in each of his final 3 seasons in points scored. He led the Pac-10 in field goals made in 1985, and finished 5th in the NCAA in this category in 1983, 7th in 1984, and 3rd in 1985. By the time his career ended, his 77 field goals made was tied with Kevin Butler for the third most in NCAA history, only behind John Lee of UCLA, who had 82, and Luis Sendejas of Arizona State, who had 81. Yes, Luis and Max were brothers. Additionally, by the time his career ended, his 77 field goals made ranked third in conference history, once again behind Lee and the others in Dejas. It really is not an exaggeration to say that Max and Dejas, at the time, was one of the greatest kickers in the history of college football. He came in and made an immediate impact as a freshman, and only got better as he continued his collegiate career, hitting clutch kick after clutch kick, and hitting them from a pretty long distance too. Zendejas was so good that he was being projected by many people as a third round pick or a fourth round pick, as he was projected to be the second kicker off of the board behind John Lee, who might have been the greatest kicker in college football history at the time. Just a case of bad timing that Zendejas was in the same conference and the same draft class as him. And as the 1986 NFL Draft rolled on, Washington was getting awfully close to being able to snatch Sandejas, and was getting close to seemingly fixing their kicking problem for good. While letting go of Mark Mosley was going to be sad after all that he did for the franchise, it was a move that had to be made. However, Washington had to put those dreams on hold, because even though Washington had picked number 113 near the start of the fifth round, by the end of the fourth round, one team had pulled the trigger on the Arizona kicker because with pick number 100, Max Tendejas was chosen by none other than their biggest rival, the Dallas Cowboys. Now, you might be asking yourself a very valid question. Did Dallas need a kicker? And the answer to that question, quite simply, is no. Rafael Septien was their kicker, and even though he had somewhat of a down year in 1985, was only going to be 33 years old heading into the 1986 season, so he still had plenty left in the tank. In two of the previous three seasons, 
he hit above 79% of his field goals, and in three of the last five seasons, finished inside the top seven of the league in field goal percentage, finishing fourth in 1981, seventh in 1983, and fifth in 1984. Top seven means you're in the top 25%. Under no circumstances did the Cowboys need to draft a kicker, and under no circumstances did they need to do it in the fourth round, wasting high draft capital on a position they are only going to be able to carry one of. For some perspective, the Cowboys drafting a kicker in the fourth round in 1986 would be like if the New York Giants drafted a kicker in the fourth round this year. Yes, Graham Gano had somewhat of a down year compared to 2020, but he's still in his mid-30s showing no signs of slowing down. He's a few years removed from being arguably the best kicker in football after a Pro Bowl appearance, and in no way is kicker a position of need. Most of the time, when a player gets drafted, they express gratitude. They express the fact that they're happy to be playing in the NFL, and that they can't wait to prove themselves with their next team. However, Max and Dejas did not do that, because the pick was so baffling that he wondered why the heck the Cowboys even wanted him in the first place, especially since the Cowboys never made it public as to why they chose him. Zadejas said that when he received the phone call from Gil Brandt, the player personnel director of the Cowboys, he was shocked, making it only the second most shocking thing that Brandt has ever said in his life. As Zadejas said, What concerns me is that I do get a fair opportunity to win the job. I probably would have been better off somewhere else where they really need a kicker. Anytime your player is saying, Dude, why did you draft me? You literally do not need me. That's always a good sign. And the pick was so baffling that his agent, John Maloney, wanted an assurance that Zendejas would have a fair opportunity to compete for the job, and that he wouldn't be used as trade bait. Funny story about the trade bait part. Because you want to know the reason why the Cowboys drafted Zendejas? It had nothing to do with Septian whatsoever. It was entirely despite Washington. Seriously. The Cowboys made a pick and drafted a player that they didn't need for the sole reason of spiting their biggest rival. And why do I say that? Well, here's the kicker. Pun completely intended. After the Cowboys drafted Zendejas, they immediately made a phone call. That call was to Washington, as general manager Tex Schramm called up Bobby Beathard to ask if he wanted Zendejas, and to ask what 1987 draft pick he would be willing to give up to acquire him. Literally the moment that the Cowboys drafted Zendejas, they were looking for a way to dump him. I'm sure Beathard was going through a whole range of emotions when he heard this. Laughter at the fact that the Cowboys drafted a guy that they didn't need and were likely going to cut anyways. Fury at the fact that the Cowboys sabotaged him and took his guy. Angry at Tram having the audacity to request this trade. Whatever the case, it was incredibly clear after this report that the Cowboys were not serving their own best interests with this draft pick. They were trying to screw over their rival. I should note that the very next pick taken after Zendejas was Auburn offensive tackle Steve Wallace, who was drafted by the San Francisco 49ers, played 12 seasons in the NFL, started 127 games, and was named a second-team All-Pro and a Pro Bowler in 1992, being a key piece on San Francisco's offensive line throughout the first half of the 1990s. The Cowboys could have had him, but nope, they needed to screw over Washington. And the funny part about all this is that literally no one won in the end. The whole kicking competition was a complete farce, as Rafael Septien won the kicking job, meaning that Zendejas was released by the Cowboys. Now Max Zendejas handled the cut with complete grace, saying that he felt as though the Cowboys gave him a fair chance, and that they just decided to go with Septien at the end of the day. As Zendejas said, they had more confidence with him. I knew it was going to come. He was having a pretty good camp. Things just weren't going my way. Sometimes, my timing wasn't right. There were a lot of little things. He handled that with a ton of class, considering the fact that he was drafted for the sole purpose of being a bargaining chip. And sure enough, where did he wind up after getting cut by Dallas? He wound up in Washington. Good job, Cowboys. You couldn't even execute the spite pick right, because at the cost of a top 100 pick, all you did was delay Zendejas' arrival in the nation's capital by a few weeks. But to add even further insult to injury in all of this, Zendejas was absolutely terrible in the NFL. I don't know what happened to him after such a great collegiate career, but he was completely garbage at the pro level. He only lasted one season in Washington, hitting a mere 64% of his field goals, and then found his way onto the Green Bay Packers, where he was cut midway through the 1988 season after hitting just 56.3% of his field goals that season, including an atrocious game, oddly enough, against Washington where he went 1-for-3 and missed a chip shot, 
game tying field goal by kicking it onto a different planet. I did a video on that kick, so if you want to learn more about that play, and you want to learn more about how bad Zendejas was in the NFL, click the card in the upper right corner. Dallas wasted a pick, Washington didn't fix their kicking problem, and eventually got a bad kicker, and Zendejas was a complete dud in the NFL. Not a single side came out on top. It's the rarest situation where literally everyone lost. All things considered, this has to be one of the stupidest draft picks in NFL history, considering the circumstances. The Cowboys literally drafted a player for the sole intention of keeping him off Washington, which I guess makes some sense if it's a position where you can't afford to keep more than one guy. But it makes no sense if it's a kicker, because you're just going to cut him, let him hit free agency, and still find his way on the team that you didn't want him to go on. There have been thousands upon thousands of picks made in the roughly 85 years that the NFL draft has been taking place, with some of them being way weirder and way stupider than others. But this might be the only draft pick ever that was made where the sole intention and the only purpose was not to improve your team, but to spite a rival. And as the Cowboys showed in 1986, spite picks when they're executed this poorly are really stupid, because even though you're trying to hurt someone else, you're only hurting yourself. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.